Okay, so we're looking at Assyria here. This is where we left off a couple weeks ago. The Bible describes its chief moral characteristics as pride, violence, deceit, covetousness, idolatry, and witchcraft. And that's where we kind of left off last time. And this description has been confirmed by archaeology. Everything we see about it has, has verified what the Bible says about it. And by the way, we believe the Bible, even if archaeology doesn't Amen. verify it. Because the Bible's always right. And the reason we're even in this whole study here in archaeology is just to show that everything the Bible says, when archaeology gets down to it, it just verifies what the Bible already said. So if anything, all this is doing is just building our faith in the Word of God. That's why we're going through this. So we can say, nope, when the skeptic comes, when somebody comes and says something and you're like, I don't have an answer, I don't know, uh, you already your faith should be built up and say, well, I know the Word of God's always right. It's never been proven wrong. Amen. That's a pretty good track record. We can get all the science books that these people stand on and all this stuff, and we can bring those out and show all the errors in that, false things they've taught. Things we know are false, they're still teaching in these books. They're still teaching them. But these are the skeptics. They use these lies to get them to hate the Word of God and to mock the Word of God. And then when you challenge them on it, well, show me something that's wrong. I mean, I've done it before. They're like, there's errors in the Bible. I'm like, great, show me some. Show me some. And they're going, oh, well, you know, I don't know any right now. I'm like, of course you don't. There aren't any in there. Amen. There aren't. And this just helps verify it, build our faith in it. So Assyria, the description has been confirmed by archaeology. Assyria's kings mentioned in the Bible. Six Assyrian kings are mentioned by name in the Bible. All right. These kings ruled at the height of the Assyrian Empire from 745 to 627 B.C. From the time of King Hezekiah to that of Josiah. At that time, Nineveh was destroyed by Babylon. All right, Tiglath Pileser, also called Pul. He put Israel under tribute during the reign of Menahem. You see that 2 Kings 15, I think it's supposed to say 19 to 20. Um, he carried some of the northern cities into captivity. He also took tribute from Ahaz. And there's the references. I mean, write them down if you want to look at them. The Bible speaks of these guys, though. Shalmaneser V, he besieged Samaria and died during the siege. He is mentioned in 2 Kings 17.3 and 18.9. And archaeology again verifies this. Sargon II, he completed the destruction of Samaria and the captivity of Israel in 721 B.C. and is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. Sennacherib, his army was defeated at the gates of Jerusalem by the angel of the Lord. He was murdered by his sons as he worshipped his idol, Nisroch. And this is what the Bible tells us of this guy. Esar Haddon, he took the throne after Sennacherib was murdered. He is also mentioned in Ezra 4.2. And again, there's the references if we want to see them. Um, Asher, Banipal. Man, how would you like a name like that? Anybody? Man, I've heard some funny names, but that's one of them. All right, he destroyed Thebes in Egypt and collected a great library. He's mentioned in Ezra 4.10. Assyria's palaces. Sennacherib's palace in Nineveh had 71 rooms and was called the palace without a rival. Man, can you imagine that, having a, a home so big? Anybody know what the, the palace over there in England is, the queen? How many rooms are in that? Does anybody have any clue? No? I don't, I don't know either. Uh, but what is it? I don't know what it's called over there. The Abbey or something? Is that what they call it? Buckingham Palace? There we go. All right, I don't know how many rooms it has, but man, 71 rooms? That's pretty impressive, and I'm positive they weren't small rooms. I mean, this is just a artist's rendering of what it looked like going in. A drawing of Sennacherib's palace from the Oriental Institute. So this is how they reconstructed it, an artist's rendering of it. That's pretty big, pretty large. A serious palace is the rooms were lined with stone slabs covered with bas reliefs depicting hunting and military exploits. I mean, they're telling a story on it, just like, again, we talked about with Egypt, how they do it. I mean, we do it through, you know, documentaries, movies, things like that is how we tell stories today. Well, they're doing the same thing. They're just drawing it out or carving it out on, on a stone wall is what they're doing. I mean, and there's some of the actual, you know, carvings that they had. I mean, just imagine how much work went into that to carve all that out into that size. I mean, to give you an idea of how big it is, look at the... The little poles right there. You know, those are the ones you see like in the bank that stand this tall. I mean, and that goes up to the wall where those are resting. So that gives you an idea of how large those are. I mean, those things are huge. I mean, any of you ever gone to buy a picture at like Hobby Lobby or something like this? They're like 120 bucks for a picture like this big. 
How much do you think those things cost? I mean, that's some money right there just to decorate your walls with. So the more... Nineveh's walls were 30 feet high and 45 feet thick and had 15 great gates. The inner city wall was seven miles in circuit and was fronted by a deep moat. I mean, that's pretty impressive right there. 15, uh, 45 feet thick. I mean, that means so they can ride across the top, you know, but that's, I mean, impressive right there. It's a large city wall. Seven miles around the city, the inner city of it. Water was brought into the city by canals and aqueducts from as far as 25 miles away. You know, I thought we were like dumber the farther back you get. You know, I thought we didn't have any technology or anything like that. See, that's what the theory of evolution has brought forth to us. That the farther back you go, you know, the, the dumber that mankind was. You know, we're cavemen, you know, dragging our wives out of the cave by their hair. You know, I mean, that's what they, they want to teach us that we were. But it's never been like that. There's always been technology. They've always thought. These were the gates at Shalmaneser's palace. Though That's gigantic. I mean, those are huge to get in through those gates. All right, now this should just give us some perspective. I don't know necessarily that they were this size, but the gates that uh, Samson carried out, they're not going to be some little rinky-dink thing like we think of a gate today. It was city gates to stop invaders from breaking into the city and destroying everyone. They were going to be massive, huge. This gives you an idea of what it means when it says that Samson carried out the, the gates of the city and carried them up a hill. I mean, this is what he was doing. And I know everyone pictures, how many of you picture Samson like some big, huge, monstrous guy, right? I mean, he's like probably six foot five and just huge, right? That's how most of us picture him. At some point in our life, maybe we start studying the Bible, we realize it's not. But I guarantee you're a liar if you're in here and you're saying, I never pictured him like that. Yeah, you did. I know you did. At one point you did. See, but the thing is, for God to get the glory, I imagine he was just an average man. I'm not saying he wasn't strong and, and all that stuff, but he was just an, your average man. And it was God empowering him to do these things that it was like, wow, that's Samson? I guarantee a lot of people were like, that's the Samson? we've been, Him? You sure him? They're like, yeah, that's him. Because that's how God works. See, so God gets the glory. So man doesn't get the glory. God's chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the things that are wise. See, our wisdom says, oh, it's got to be some big monster, you know, like, you know, uh, some seven-foot guy that weighs 300 pounds and he's just solid rock. You know, that he could do it. Well, I doubt he could do that even, but that's how we picture it. See, the world's knowledge says, yeah, that's how it had to be. God says, no, no, no. He might have been some scrawny guy. Who knows? I mean, you don't even know. He could have been. All right, but so the gates there at Shalmaneser's palace. They were made of wood, reinforced by strips of bronze embossed with military scenes. I mean, there you go. There you see it again. What, what's he doing? He's saying, here's my exploits. Here's what I've done as a king. He's telling everybody. He's telling a story right there of his victories. The throne rooms of the palaces were guarded by Lama Su, which were human-headed winged bulls or lions. These are idolatrous creatures, obviously. The head signifies intelligence, the wings speed, the body power. And these things are gigantic right here, too. I'm, where do you think they get the idea of stuff like this from? I just want us to think. I just, I'm just going to kind of just... That's right, things like that. You know, that's exactly where they get it from. What are they called, those creatures? I No. They're... They got a name for them in the Bible. No, it's not any of those creatures. It's something else. It's, uh, it's like an animal's body with a human head. Anybody remembering? I can't think of the name of what they... Maybe it'll hit me. All right, but it's this right here. But the Bible mentions them by name, these types of creatures that look like this. But I'm just, where do you think they get an idea like this from? I mean, I don't know exactly, but there was some crazy stuff going on around Noah's time. All right, and the Bible, you get into the book of Revelation, talks about some crazy creatures are going to be coming out again. See, I, I mentioned something like that, and some of you are like, yeah, right, there's really creatures like that. Man, why don't we believe this book? Why don't we believe this book? Some of you are, might be thinking, you're like, yeah, right, there's stuff like that. Well, where'd they get the idea for it? Where'd they get the idea for it? You know, we don't know what's, what people have seen. 
I mean, any of you seen a dinosaur? Yes, you have. You ever seen an alligator? You saw a dinosaur? You ever seen a rhino? You've seen a dinosaur? I mean, but you know, all right, you've never seen a T-Rex. Any of you ever seen a T-Rex? No, an alligator, yeah, yeah. You see, but we believe these creatures exist. And then you go back and you look at archaeology and you look at thousands of years ago and how come they've got these creatures that look like dinosaurs drawn on, you know, walls? Why would that happen unless they had seen them? Because they're all buried, right? I mean, they died, you know, millions of years before we were here. They died, right? And then you find, you know, there's a, a dinosaur footprint and a man's footprint. Right there. I forget where that was. it in Texas? Is that where that was from? Was, it was in Texas and Utah. All right. But no, they were never together. You know, because millions of years would have washed it away, right? Okay, I don't know. I mean, did you guys ever seen the rainstorm we just had, how it washed everything away? Huh. But, but those two are there together. How did that happen? Maybe they were actually together, like the Bible says. See, that's what I'm talking about. We're, like, we're afraid to say that dinosaurs and men were together at the same time. Well, by the way, we still are today. But you know what I mean when I say dinosaurs? I'm talking like a, a T-Rex, a, you know, what are those other ones? The, the um, brontosaurus and all that stuff, the long neck. Yeah, that's, that's what I was thinking of. I forget their name. What are they called? Bronchiosaurus. All right. Uh, anyway, I was thinking of the land before times, how I remembered it. <laughs> Long necks. All right. Anyway, moving on. Okay. But I mean, we, we, I don't even know where I was going now. See, I lose my train of thought, but these dinosaurs and men existed at the same time. And you know, that's exactly what history tells us. That's exactly what archeology span tells us. And we hear those things and, and we're afraid to stand on it because the Bible says it, because the Bible teaches it, because What's politically correct today and what's popular today is to say that that isn't what happened. And the reason being is because they will demonize you if you believe that. And you say, well, what do you mean by demonize? They're going to make you feel like a fool. Amen. They're going to laugh at you and say, oh, you believe dinosaurs and men existed at the same time? And I'm like, well, the evidence says yes. So, I mean, we should be laughing at them. <laughs> you don't believe they existed at the same time? I mean, that's what we should be doing to them. Are you that foolish? Have you not looked into any of the evidence? I mean, man, your whole geologic column amazes me. They got, you know, petrified trees running through the geologic column. I'm like, hell, how'd that happen? Oh, hello. I didn't mean to say hell. I stopped at the wrong time, okay? I meant to say hello, and I started saying something else. That came out wrong. All right. But hello, how'd that happen? You know, because maybe there was a big worldwide flood just like the Bible says. So when we start looking at all these things and how the Bible proves itself right time and 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 time again, then when it, something pops up that we don't get or don't have an answer for, we can just say, well, the Bible says this, so the Bible's right. And that's what we're trying to do with all of this, okay? So these creatures came from... You know, obviously they'd seen something like this. Maybe the devil showed them something like this. I don't know, but Revelation talks about some crazy creatures are going to come out. And, you know, there's people that want to allegorize the Scripture, and they're going, to say, they're going to try and say, oh, it's a tank, it's a helicopter, it's all this stuff. I mean, that's not what it says. That is not what it says. I mean, it says this creature is coming out. Why don't we just believe that? Because it's, it's kind of too hard to believe. Well, everything else the Bible said has been right. All right. They had five legs so that when viewed from the front, they appeared to be standing still. So you'll see it. So see, it looks like it's just standing there like this, right? Now, from the side, though, they've got the fifth leg is this, you know, the second one back. So it looks like it's walking. Why they did it like that, I don't know. But there you can see all five of them. One, two, three, four, five. All right. And this is what the, so this is like they re, remade it. They brought these things out and just stuck them in there like that. So these were the real things. And this is the artist's rendering of what the palace would have looked like as people walked through there. And no doubt the face on there is, you know, the Shalmanasser, I think is who we we're talking about. So Assyria's Grand Library. Hey, you know, they, they didn't have speech back then. They didn't have, you know, a written language back then. So how could they have a library? You know, so here's what happens is people bring, you talk about worldviews, okay? People bring their worldview to something, and all of us do this. So we have to watch ourselves, but everybody does this. But we're going to bring our worldview, what we believe about how the world is and how it exists, and we're going to bring it in to whatever we're looking at. So people will bring their worldview into things like this, 
and say, and the worldview is, you know, the lost skeptic world, the, the just God-hating world, however you want to call it. Some, not every one of them is God-hating, but you understand what I'm saying, basically. The, the liberal world that's out there today, okay? Bible-denying world that's out there today. So they're going to bring their skeptic worldview that says, no, writing didn't exist, you know, thousands of years ago. They didn't have a knowledge of that. Um, so they come across this, and now what do they do with that? What are they going to do with that? They have a written language. They have a library. 30,000 volume library. That's a lot of books. That's a whole lot of books. It just goes against what they teach. And I mean, there's more ancient libraries than this. We've looked at that before when we've gone through this. But I'm just saying, look, here, is, here we see again, man, the Bible always being verified. You know, in the time of Abraham, when they said he couldn't have had written language, well, we proved that he did in, in Ur of the Chaldees, that they had libraries like this. I mean, this is the same region, by the way. It's the same region there, the Fertile Crescent. All right, some of the books are on display at the British Museum. I mean, man, imagine to be a Bible thumper back then to really hit someone over the head with a... All right, I'm just kidding. Okay. <laughs> The surviving books are written on clay tablets, but the original library would have been vastly larger. The books written on leather scrolls, wax boards, and papyri have perished. Obviously, they didn't make it. The library was spread out into many rooms according to subject matters such as history, religion, geography, science, and poetry. Isn't that still how we do it today? We break up a library by subject? Here's what they're doing right there. You know, we haven't really gotten much more advanced than man's ever been. As a matter of fact, we're de-evolving. <laughs> we're not getting better we're getting dumber okay that's just what it is we are we do not have the intelligence who here can make up a language anybody can okay say i i, I believe prob, my opinion is that adam was formed you know full grown he had the ability to speak i believe he also had the ability to write as well could i prove that no but he we know he had the ability to speak okay my assumption is, and I could be wrong, is that he also had the ability to write. But now think about all these other languages. How in the, Could you develop a written language? Anybody here, could you? And, a, and just a whole other spoken language? Could you do something like that? I mean, think about the intelligence that was, that was there in order to do that. Now some might say, well, God gave, you know, he confounded the language at, Babel, at Babylon. Okay, I'll give you that. Now how about a written language for all of them? Where'd that come from? I mean, how, how would you go about doing that? That's some intelligence right there to be able to do that. I mean, that's, think about that. Think about how hard that would be. Right, and then teaching it, getting it across to everyone. Have any of you ever even tried to make up a word or a new letter? Have you ever tried to make up a letter? Anybody ever tried to make up just another letter? And how would I say it? What would it look like? I mean, I'm coming up with all sorts of off-the-wall stuff. I'm like, I don't know. How do you make another sound? I mean, I don't know. It's just it's difficult. Think about it, though. All right. So each room contained a tablet near the door, classifying the contents, and each section had a brief description. I mean, look, if you go into Home Depot, if you go into Walmart, they still do the same thing. You're like, hey, you know, where's the cereal at? Well, you look at the aisle. Maybe they have it above it or something, but it's telling you what's down that row. This is the same thing they're doing right there. The actual cataloging activities under uh, Asher Banipal's direction would not be seen in Europe for centuries. What? Why? Thought we're getting better. The, the Assyrians were exceedingly cruel. It is no wonder God's word called Nineveh the bloody city. I mean, they did some atrocious things. I mean, they were known for their cruelty. I mean, just wicked. This is going to put some things in perspective for Jonah and why he did not want to go to the Ninevites. They were, I mean, off, we're going to see some things. They were horrible. I'm going to have to stop here pretty soon. We'll just stop right here. We'll get to it in a couple weeks. All right, who wants me to keep going? No one? Anybody? Okay, we'll keep going a little bit. My daughter, she, so that got everyone, okay? All right, a serious cruelty. Consider the following description of Asser Nasser Paul's military campaign into Syria from a bas relief at his palace at Kala. Here's what he said. Here's, this is his account of Asser Nasser Paul's military campaign, okay? Here's his account. 
He says, I built a pillar over against his city gate and I flayed all the chief men. We're going to find out what flaying is here. And I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. These are the POWs. Okay, this is what they did to the POWs. Who knows what a POW, who doesn't know what a POW is? Okay, a prisoner of war. Okay, the, en- the enemy's army that gets captured. This is what they did to them, okay? I flayed all the chief men. That may, hey, the officers, we're going to make an example of you. We're going to show everyone what we do to those that want to stand against us. She says, I flayed them and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar, some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. So to flay someone means to skin them. Skinning humans. Who here has skinned an animal? Few of us. It's a lot of work, isn't it? I'm not talking about a rabbit. I mean, that's pretty easy. But who is, and it's still the same thing. But when you try and skin like an elk or something, man, you're there like tugging while someone's slicing. It's not that easy. And you got to keep sharpening those knives because they get dull quick. And this is what they're doing to the chief men. They say, bring the general out. The general of the other army. And they're going to flay him. Based on their cruelty, it wouldn't surprise me if they started doing it while they were alive. I would not doubt that at all. He goes on to say, I cut off the limbs of the officers. Many captives from among them I burned with fire. And many I took as living captives. Look, they're burning these people alive. Now, when I think of a couple ways to die, let me just let's just take a survey here. All right, if the options are drowning to death or burning alive, who wants to who wants to burn alive? You? No? Okay, I'm like, oh, okay. You want to burn alive? Till that flame hits, I guarantee you. (laughs) Yeah, no way. I don't think you could handle the burning alive either. <laughs> uh, so who wants to drown? I'd way rather drown. Way rather drown. I mean, any day of the week, I'd rather drown. Any day of the week. I mean, when the panic hits and everything, at least you're not in a ton of torment like you would if you're burning alive. I don't know how you could want to do that, brother. That's just insanity to me. There ain't no way. Oh, man. Especially if like they used to burn a lot of our Baptist forefathers. You know, if they were merciful on them, they'd, they'd use dry faggots. Okay, what's faggots? It's a pile of wood basically put together. If they weren't merciful to them and they were like a super mean heretic that they really didn't like, who was very outspoken, they'd get green ones, green wood. You ever tried to light a fire with wet wood? Yeah, it would take a long time and they'd suffer and it would just slowly burn them. Then the fire would go out, they'd light it again. Yeah, he's suffering, suffering. Usually when they lit them, when they burned them at the stake, I'm talking about people just like you and me that believe like we do right now. They were burning people for believing what we believe right here. For the baptism we hold to, the baptism we stand on, they were burning our people for that. Usually what would happen if they burnt them and it would really burn up, the flames would, not the flames, I'm sorry, the smoke would, they die of suffocation first. Not always. And you're still going to feel the pain, but usually that would eventually kill them before the flames actually killed them. But this is what they did to people. So here we got, they're burning them alive, flaying them. They took some as living captives. From From some I cut off their hands, and from others I cut off their noses, their ears, and their fingers. Think about that. To have your nose cut off, your eyes gouged out, your fingers cut off, I mean, think about how miserable that would be, how awful that would be, and then them just leave you there, your ears being cut off. Of many I put out the eyes. I made one pillar of the heads, and I bound their heads to posts round about the city. What did they do? They're cutting, hacking their heads off and sticking them on posts around the city. What are they saying? When, yeah, when the Assyrian army comes through, watch out. Here's what you're going to get. It's not going to take long for that to spread. And everyone's just going to, hey, when they come through, just, whoa, just let them. Just let them. Don't fight. That's what's going to happen. Assyrian soldiers flaying or skinning captives at Lachish. So here they are. You can see these guys tugging on their skin, pulling their skin. I mean, just 
head to toe. Can you imagine the pain of that? Now put yourself on the other side, if you're the Assyrian army doing that, the barbarity of that. The barbarity of that. How desensitized you'd have to be. I mean, have anybody ever seen some of the atrocities that the, the Nazis did in the concentration camps? You ever seen pictures of some of that stuff? I mean, how just grotesque and disgusting that is. There was officers there in the Nazi army as their men were, they're watching their men just slaughter these people. And it's not even the experiments, I mean, just slaughtering them, you know, shooting them, bashing their heads in, whatever, just the many ways they killed them. And some of the officers are watching this and they're watching what's happening to their men and they're saying, we can't keep doing this. They're, these guys are getting like, the officers are watching them and saying, they're getting beyond help. I mean, where they don't value life at all. And they, they wanted to pull them back from it. During that same time, World War II, the, the, I believe it was the U.S. Army, they did a study on um, how much one man could take as far as going into live action, how many days constant they could take. And I forget what the number was. It was like up to 260 days is what one man can take. They said after that, you have to pull them away because it'll, it'll just mess them up completely. And that's what they determined based on what they were seeing, men going into battle just constantly. They said they can handle about 260 days, I think it was. It might have been 240. Um, but that's how many days of battle they can handle. Other than that, you need to pull them out. They said in that same article, they didn't word it like this, but I'm just saying it this way. They said the good news is, not that it's good news, they didn't say that, so I'm just kind of giving you uh, a shortened version of it. But they said the good news is that most of the men will never survive that long, so we don't have to worry about that. Because they're going to die before then, is what the implication was. They said after that, that's all one man can handle. But if they just break down, they go into shell shock. I mean, where they'll just be just, you know, can't do nothing. I mean, just blabbering on. They can't think straight. So they said you have to pull them out from that. So now imagine the barbarity of what these men and how vicious and cruel they were. You start doing stuff like that, you're not going to care if it's a man, woman, child, old person. You will not care. You will not care. That's why we better stop and think and ask ourselves about some of this nonsense that's going on where we're devaluing life and we're wanting to do late-term abortions. I mean, look, it's one thing. It's all wicked, evil murder, period. It's satanic. Abortion is satanic. I don't care if it's a week after inception, conception. It does not matter. It's satanic to, to destroy that human life. But it's one thing to do it inside the womb when you can't really see what you're doing. And... Man, the barbarity of, it is no different than this right here. They are ripping a living human child apart limb by limb. That's what abortion is. They don't want to talk about that. I've had people tell me, you shouldn't talk about that in the pulpit. I'm like, well, where are, we, where are we going to talk about it? Everyone's afraid to say anything. Well, you might make the ladies that have had abortion feel bad. Good, they murdered their child. Amen. Amen. They murdered their child. Can God forgive it? Amen, absolutely. God can forgive that. Does it mean because people have done it that we should just be like, well, it's okay? No. No, it's not okay. Should we stop preaching against adultery because, well, there might be someone in here who's committed adultery? No, it's not okay. You did it. God can forgive it. Amen. Amen. But it doesn't mean we don't preach against it. It's wrong. And that's the same way. Abortion's murder. The woman might feel guilty. Good. She ought to feel guilty. The man ought to feel guilty too. The wicked devils that'll say, I'll pay for it. Just you get it taken care of. Here's the money. You sorry devil Amen. to tell a woman that, to put a woman in that position where she'd even consider that. What a good for nothing devil. But it's no different what we're doing. And we want to dehumanize the value of life by pulling that child out part way and, and, and take its life. You think, what, where's that barbarity going to stop? I mean, how many of you people, how many of you remember when, uh, in 2008, when Sarah Palin, they're talking about getting, uh, maybe it was 2010 or whenever, but when they talked about, you know, Obamacare and, uh, one payer system, all it is is socialism. By the way, let me say, if you're for socialism, let me stop right here too and talk about something that's going on in this city about, um, on Tuesday, we need to vote against this thing of, what is it, the mandatory sick days off, that, that ordinance. If you think that's a good thing, man, you've been brainwashed by the liberal media. 
Because you're forcing someone, you're forcing a business to do something that should be their decision. That is not liberty. Amen. That is not liberty. It's thievery is what it is. Because right. if they don't do it, what are they doing? It's a threat at the point of a gun. You say, they're not putting a gun to anyone's head. Well, let's just see them not keep that ordinance and see if they don't go to jail. You see, I'm just telling you, we ought to vote against that thing. Amen. Vote against it. Are you against sick leave? No. But I'm against liberty and the employer should be able to decide that. Hey, if you, the place you work at doesn't offer sick leave, get up and go somewhere that does. Right. That'll tell employers right there, if people are leaving, all right, maybe I need to offer sick leave. But when we start taking the ability for one business, a business person to, to do what they want and act, treat their business how they want, you know, this stuff like this puts business, people out of business. Right. That's what it does when you force it on them. Force the minimum wage on them. Look, we ought to pay people right. But man, if I can go somewhere and get 10 bucks an hour doing the same thing, you want to pay me eight, guess where I'm going? You won't have employees. Right. So either you're going to fix your business or you'll go under. That's how it should work. But when we want to force people to do things at the point of a gun, that we're no, we're no longer in liberty, I'm just telling you right now. But the social, uh, socialism and the, um, the brainwashing of that through the liberal media, and I don't care if it's Fox or whatever, they want to call itself conservative, all of it is, is brainwashing us to think a certain way. I mean, where now we've got, you know, eight years ago, they were against, uh, what is it, the medicine, the socialized medicine, Obamacare. And it was, you know, repeal Obamacare. And then Obamacare gets passed. And that's just more socialism, okay? It's just forcing people to have to pay for something for somebody else. Hey, is it all right if I kick your door in and I start taking from you? Well, my family needs it. What, do you hate me? You won't let me break into your house and steal from you? Well, how's it any different if they just do it in your check before you get it? There is no difference. We just don't see it like that because we're conditioned to think it's okay. Well, we've got to give the government their fair share. Hey, they're stealing from us. Amen. What fair share? What fair share? So we're conditioned to think all this stuff's okay. And it's all right to steal. We have to realize that, that is, it's wrong. Where, where's it wrong at? Well, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. It doesn't matter if it's government. Thou shalt not steal. See, our income is, is personal property. Right. It's personal property. I understand taxes are necessary. There's certain things we need. But we don't need to pay for everyone's everything. I shouldn't be paying for a, a grown man and a grown woman even at that. I shouldn't be paying their bills for them. Neither should, none of us should be. Amen. Get a job and work. Amen. Get a job and work. I used to uh, go to church with a man and he had some rentals, some rental property um, in the East Mountains and he would rent it out and the people weren't paying so he'd take them to jail and the judge would come down on him. You know, get all mad at him. They, oh, you're throwing this family out on the street. And I mean, to me, I'm hearing all this. I'm like, man, I, I don't want to be in that situation, but I would kind of like to be in that situation before the judge. Not, I don't want to, okay? But if I was, I'm like, man, what are you talking about? Well, hey, I'm all for letting them stay there. You know, praise the Lord. You know, they're not paying, so they're taking money out of my family's mouth. They're taking food out of my family's mouth. Hey, judge, I agree with you. Let them stay there for free. You can pay their rent. Yep. And I guarantee, oh, well, well, you want me to give it to them? Why don't you give it to them? Because it's okay when it's somebody else's money. It's okay to take somebody else's money. But when it's mine, no, 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 no. Then it's not okay. I had a discussion with a family member before the election. I said, man, this, how backwards is this country when now we've got a viable option for, for president of the United States is a self-professing socialist. Bernie Sanders. And this family member of mine said, well, what's wrong with socialism? I said, well, it's stealing. I said, if you want to give all this money away and you want to give and pay for all this stuff, go ahead. But don't take it from me at the point of a gun. And people will freak out. Oh, no one's pointing a gun at your head. Think it through. And yes, they are. Just think it through. Don't obey them and see what happens. Don't obey and see what happens. Okay, I'm just telling you. We better think some of this stuff through. I say vote against that ordinance. That, that's nothing we should be forcing on people to do. Amen. Should a business offer sick leave? Yes, I think it's a good idea. Does a business have to? Absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. That's like me coming into your house and telling you, hey, you have to come to Liberty Baptist Church now. If the government came into your house and told you you have to do that, people would be all up in arms. They'd be, we don't have to do separation of church and state. You know, we have rights. Right. No one should have to come and tell you that you have to come to some church. Right. Well, no one should be able to come into my house and tell me I have to do this. But see, we've got been so conditioned that everyone's got to give, 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 give. Government's got to give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. No, government shouldn't give me, give me, give me, give me. Stay out of my life. Just let me keep my money and stay out of my life. Earned income, credit, all that stuff. Get rid of that junk. Amen. Man, you see, I see these homeless guys up and down begging for money. You're like 23 years old. Man, get a job and work. I ain't giving you Amen. nothing. Get a job and work. The Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. That's right. Get a job and work. I understand some of them got hooked on drugs or whatever. Still, get a job and work. That's right. I mean, you're choosing that. Well, they're addicts. They don't have a choice. Man, we have a lot of ex-addicts in here. Yep. Amen. Amen. We got a lot of ex-addicts in here that are living for God, serving God, and working and taking care of their families. So it can be done. You're choosing not to. Right. Well, you don't know what it's like. How do you know I don't know what it's like? How do you know? Bible says such words, some of you. You're not still that. If you're lost, you are. Hey, if you're lost, go to AA. You against AA? Yes, I am. Yep. Yes, I am. It's another God that they teach. They're just praying to some greater power. They teach you you're always an addict. You're always an alcoholic. Like it's some de disease you catch. Chew! Oh, I caught alcoholism. No, you're a drunkard. Let's just call it what the Bible calls it. Amen. Stop making excuses for all these things. But that's what we want to do. Our, hey, our government teaches us. Hey, they're an addict now. We're going to take care of them. You know, you, oh, you're hooked on heroin? Here, let's give you methadone for the rest of your life. What? What? And it's there. Now, look, if someone's on that and they're in that program, man, hey, look, get the help you need. Get off it. But they brainwash them to think you're going to need this the rest of your life. No, you don't. You don't need it the rest of your life. See, such were some of you. See, Jesus has the power to change that. The Lord Jesus Christ has the power to change all that. For let him. See, man, I'm telling you, the Bible gets real. We start looking at some of the things the Bible teaches. And we want to look at the barbarity that, that is coming out of this. There's nothing new under the sun. The barbarity that these men were able to do and perform and to do these things. Right. Well, I don't know. Sometimes, I don't know if that's necessarily children. Sometimes it's just the way they depict it um, because of how they have to to make everything fit. But. Very well, very likely they're teaching their children. Their children are growing up in that type of society, being taught those things. Maybe not like just like that, but they are being taught it because we can go back and just look in recent history and go back and look at the Hitler youth. And they were being taught these things. They were being brainwashed. Look, this is, this is the reason why I'm against public education. Amen. Because it's brainwash and indoctrination. That's what it is. College campuses. How come all this stuff happens on college campuses? You go back to the 60s. You got all the hippies. Where's it coming out of? Lib liberal places. Berkeley. All that stuff's happening in these types of places. Supposed free thought. You know, and they're fighting. We have the freedom of speech. And now those same people today want to take our freedom of speech from us. You sure do have freedom of speech. You can say whatever you want. And if they're not brain dead, they'll recognize that. I'm telling you, you're brain dead if you want freedom of speech for you, but not for somebody else. See people holding posters. Freedom of speech doesn't mean you can, you can uh, say hateful things. You're a brain dead moron, period. To hold up a sign like that, you're brain dead and you're not thinking. That's mean, preacher, but it's true, isn't it? And sometimes somebody just needs to say what's true Amen. because you're not thinking. If, if That's not free speech then. That is not free speech. Look what they did during uh, George W. Bush's presidency. They're all free speech zones. They're going to protest the president and they put a free speech zone somewhere he's never even going to drive by. Man, the whole U.S. is a free speech zone. Amen. I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican. Man, tyranny's tyranny. Can we just recognize that? We ought to. We ought to recognize it. So how did I get off on all this? Because of the barbarity that's here. And I mentioned earlier Sarah Palin talking about death panels. Okay, when we devalue life in any sense, what she talked about, everyone's like, that's ridiculous. There'll never be death panels. Man, you people don't think. 
And I'm not saying you, I'm talking about the people out there, do not think. When you put everyone on health care, free health care, you think there's not going to be a committee deciding if this 90-year-old person is going to get a heart transplant? I mean, just if any of us are thinking, you're like, that's not really, you know, there's, you know, there's a, a 12-year-old that could really use a heart who has their whole life ahead of him versus this 90-year-old. No, nah, we're not going to give that 90-year-old the heart. See, because we devalue life. So you think, yeah, well, and people are going to be like, well, that makes sense. Till it's your grandma, till it's your grandpa, till it's you. So when we allow the abortion mills, death and barbarity, and we even say it's a right, it's a right to murder your own child now. What? I've told you all before, but I want you to keep it in mind. You wait, they're going to come out and they're going to say, you can murder your child up to like two years old. There's already people advocating for that. All right. All of it, but it's, you're going to hear it more and more mainstream. They're already pushing, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, pedophilia. How can they stop it? Every argument they use for the sodomites, they can use the same thing in that. Well, it's love. That you're going to use the same thing for bestiality. We love each other. You can't say we don't love each other. See, when there's no morality, where does it stop? See, the barbarity, it just keeps going. You think, how could somebody do something like that? And I'm telling you, they're doing all that in front of the people they conquered. I mean, you think wives and children were watching their dads be flayed alive? You think that husbands and children weren't, and parents weren't watching ladies be ravished? You think that wasn't going on? You study any war, that stuff happens. Any war, I don't care when it is. Any war, that stuff happens to women in every single war. Every time. Every time. To children. Every time. We're getting better, right? No. The barbarity of it right here. All right, the triangular shapes depict the helmets of the Assyrian soldiers signifying the vastness of the army. I mean, just taking them over. Prisoners impaled. There they are, sticking them on poles. Right through. Completely naked. No clothes. We'll stop here.